The following is a production of the Dallas Genealogical Society. For more information, please visit our website at dallasgenealogy.org. And then I'm going to ask Patty Smith if she would um, introduce today's speaker for us. Thank you, Jim. I uh, appreciate all that update, and we've got some exciting programs coming up. And especially today, we are happy to have um, our speaker, John Verse Lewis, and he is from the, um, he's the Dean of the Texas Heritage Museum at the uh, Hill College in Hillsboro. So the session today is going to be um, an overview of the collection at the Hill College Texas Heritage Museum. There are three divisions. He's going to talk about the galleries and collections, Hill College Press, and the Historical Research Center. Um, John is extremely qualified to be talking to us today. Um, he it has spearheaded um, the museum since 2005. He oversees the three different divisions there at the Hill College. And um, he also serves as the immediate past president of the Association of Academic Museums and Galleries and serves at as an uh, American Alliance of Museum peer reviewer and is a consultant for the Bridge, uh, Bridge Street History Center in Granbury, Texas. Um, John was the, he served as the director of the Greater Southwest Historical Museum in Ardmore, Oklahoma from 2003 to 2005. And he was the director of the North Platte Valley Museum, currently known as Legacy of the Plains Museum in Gearing, Nebraska. He was there from 2003 to, or 2000 to 2003. He received his museum training at New Mexico State University, where he earned his MA in American History and Public History, graduated that program in 2000. At uh, the New Mexico State University, he became a recipient of the Dona Anna Historical Society. Oh boy, um, John, you'll have to correct me on this. He won a great award and um, for co-authoring the historic architectural styles, Las Cruces, New Mexico, celebrating 150 years. So would you please help me welcome a virtual welcome for our speaker today, John Verse Lewis. Great, thank you, Patty, so much for that great introduction. And uh, I was sharing with just real quick with Susan and Tony. My father passed away. We just had its fun his funeral. So, if I'm a little uh, uh, disjointed here, just uh, my apologies. So, um, well, I have not come back to work yet. Still here at the house uh, dealing with all that, but. Um, we're going to have a great morning. We're going to have a, a wonderful uh, tour of the museum, and then I'm going to really get into specifics at the uh, about the Historical Research Center, one of our divisions. So it's okay. I'm going to go ahead and share the screen. Let's try that. Okay, there we go. And. Um, I know I, I can't see everybody's hand go up, but I'm sure a few of you have visited our Historical Research Center uh, at Hill College, um, also known uh, pr in prior years, uh, prior to 2006 as the Confederate Research Center. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the overall umbrella of the museum, and then we'll get into uh, specifics about uh, the different divisions at the, at the Texas Heritage Museum. So the very um, first part is, um, we're located right on the main campus, right in the middle of campus. And uh, we have a 15,000 uh, square foot facility. And um, the Texas Heritage Museum is one of three museums that's appropriated by the State Appropriations of Texas. And we are a department under Hill College. Um, but it's uh, interesting how we're funded. I have to go to Austin and uh, defend my budget there. And then of course, then defend my budget again uh, with the uh, Hill College Board of Regents and uh, the college administration. Um, we started uh, back in 1962 when Colonel B. Simpson 
uh, was a history professor here at Hill College and a retired colonel in the Army and Air Force. And uh, he loved Civil War. And he started collecting books and he asked very simple if he could have one shelf in the library for his Civil War books. And they gave them that shelf with, with, with great pride. And ever since then, people kept donating him more and more books. And then came with those books came Civil War swords and guns and equipment. And so in 1964, the Board of Regents at Hill College uh, came up with the Confederate Research Center and Gun Museum along with Hill College Press. And that continued um, all the way up to uh, 1989 uh, when the Colonel um, Simpson passed away. And then they kind of wanted to expand the museum. So in, uh, 19, in the early 1990s, we worked with uh, Lieutenant Governor Bob Bullock at the time. Uh, he was a Hillsborough native uh, and went to Hill College. And so the college administration worked with Bob Bullock to create the Texas Heritage Museum which was to showcase all wars Texas fought in from the time of Texas Republic up to the present time. And uh, then uh, once uh, that was done in 1998, uh, we renovated uh, this building. Um, it used to be the library and then they turned it uh, completely into the museum and built a new library. Um, so our mission, is real simple is to explore Texas and Texas during wartime and how those experiences affect us today. Um, the first part of that mission is real simple. Um, of course, we, we look at Texans at war. We don't get into politics. Uh, war happened and we look at the men and women and really concentrate on their personal stories uh, through wartime. The second part of that mission statement is, is a little bit more complicated. It's, it's more has an educational component and how those experiences affect us today. Well, us is anybody who visits the museum. So as we go through the galleries, you, uh, here is a, a World War I photo, uh, of one of our exhibits. Um, again, uh, anybody that uh, had parents or grandparents uh, back in World War I will know a little bit more about it than uh, any of the, uh, the, the school children coming through, especially we just celebrated the 100th anniversary uh, of World War I not too long ago. Um, but we capture, we capture different experiences uh, in our galleries. We have journals, uh, for instance, in our Vietnam gallery where people can, uh, veterans can leave their personal experiences in their journal. Um, and that has been very powerful. Uh, a lot of the Vietnam veterans um, have not, really talked about the war uh, because it was not a popular war, as you all know, when the veterans came back and they were not received and welcomed uh, very well at all. And so, you know, there are a lot of them are just now talking about it and uh, they really appreciate it. Um, we uh, still have World War II veterans that get choked up going through our exhibits and uh, Vietnam and, and Korean veterans as well. And sometimes they have to come back two or three times just to uh, be able to actually get through the exhibit because uh, it just brings up so many emotions and, and stories and memories of them. And we try to capture that as, uh, where we can. Um, we have a lot of school groups that come through. Here is a picture right in the middle of our Civil War gallery in front of uh, General Hood. Um, and uh, again, they uh, different school groups come out of the Metroplex, um, uh, as far as away as Temple, Texas. So we have about a hundred mile radius. Uh, we get a lot of school groups, all the ages from eh, about second grade, all the way up through high school, uh, visit our, our uh, galleries and do education components uh, throughout the year. Uh, here is another school group going into the start of our World War II gallery. And uh, this is another group uh, in our end of our World War II gallery into the Korean War gallery. And um, again, it's, um, it's interesting um, over the last 17 years now where all the school kids are really focused on the Vietnam War because that's the war their grandparents fought in. Um, they really don't know much about World War II. Um, so we've seen the shift of of, of, of students and children coming through of their grandparents in World War II now to the to the end of Korea and into the Vietnam War. Um, this is another picture right in the middle of our gallery of our Vietnam exhibit. Um, 
we were real fortunate um, with our Vietnam exhibit. We have some one of the kind artifacts. What you're looking at here is an exhibit on the tunnel rats. And we've got a lot of the original tools and uh, with bamboo um, um, and uh, bamboo uh, booby traps and, and, and such. And um, one of the most interesting collections that were donated uh, of our Vietnam collection to the museum was by Chuck Carlock, uh, who lives in the Fort Worth, Dallas area. Uh, he was a uh, Vietnam uh, uh, helicopter pilot. He did his tour duty in 1968. And his uh, bunkmate was the quartermaster uh, officer over shipping and receiving. Well, back then, you, if you're an officer, you could ship a lot of stuff back to the States. And uh, he ended up shipping three warehouses full of stuff back to his mother onto her front porch in Fort Worth, Texas. And uh, luckily he did so because there are a lot of one of a kind odd of objects that uh, are the only ones left in the Vietnam War, especially a lot of the handmade tools and, and such. And um, uh, we were able to have first pick of his collection. Um, Texas Tech got second pick and then the Smithsonian got third pick. Um, so we, we are real excited to showcase a lot of his collection in this exhibit. Uh, we have a, 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 um, we just renovated this. I need to put a new picture. We just renovated it about two weeks ago. And um, this is our museum theater. And this is where um, we have school groups or visitors come in. We have a lot of different films on the, um, that we've commissioned on the Medal of Honor of Texas, uh, Civil War, uh, World War II, um, anything again, involving any, any military units that fought as Texans, uh, we have some films on. We also teach Hill College classes in this room. Um, we average about four to 500 students a week through the museum uh, and the Hill College faculty teaches uh, US history, world history, Texas history. We have art history, art appreciation and uh, government uh, is also taught in this room. And it's great because the students at Hill College are able to use our collections and the faculty uses our collections we bring into the classroom or they go out into the galleries to really understand different pieces of art or different aspects of history. And they can see it firsthand rather than just seeing it in a textbook or uh, you know, on a YouTube video or, or, or and such. So um, it is, it's a wonderful addition to our museum. And then out front, uh, we built the um, Medal of Honor Memorial to native born Texans in front of our uh, museum in 2007. And it became the official Texas Medal of Honor Memorial to native born Texas in 2009 by the state legislature. And to date, we have 62 native born Texans um, who received the Medal of Honor. This uh, was an interesting project I did. Um, talking about genealogy and, and such, because what constituted a Texan during the Civil War and what constitutes a Texan today are vastly different. And to keep, keep it on equal footing, we said, well, you just have to be native born um, because we have a lot of Medal of Honor recipients that um, might, might have, uh, their hometown might be in Franklin, Tennessee, but they moved to Texas in their you know, mid seventies to retire. Well, do we put them on our Medal of Honor Memorial? Uh, and we, it was just gonna create a lot, of, a lot of problems. So we just decided to stick with native born and uh, that kept an equal footing for all. And uh, we just added uh, one from Afghanistan um, and to our Medal of Honor Memorial in December. Um, so he was our 62nd uh, recipient. And uh, it's a living memorial. We'll keep adding Medal of Honor recipients to the memorial as, as we go on. Um, the most decorated soldier of, of World War II, of course, you all know is Audie Murphy. And the most decorated sailor of World War II is Samuel Dealey. Uh, of course, his family, uh, very prominent in Dallas and, and Dealey Plaza is named after, uh, after his family there. Uh, he was uh, a, a, a submarine commander um, is the most decorated naval uh, uh, soldier of World War II or sailor. Uh, we have Hill College Press. Um, so out of 50 community colleges in the state of Texas, we are the only one that publishes books. Uh, very, very, very small scale. Uh, we usually try to publish one book every year or every couple of years. Um, 
we have published 49 titles to date. And uh, we're looking at uh, a couple that will be coming out uh, in the near future, hopefully. And so that's another thing that uh, Colonel Simpson started. Uh, he was an avid Civil War historian and writer and wrote a lot of books. And uh, that really what started the, the press. So our first publication was published in, in 1964 and uh, uh, to the present day. And it's mainly, again, on Texas during war. Uh, and, but we do also have some special topics we do publish on uh, North Central Texas as well. That's non-military, but uh, we've only published maybe three titles that, that weren't directly uh, Texas uh, at war of uh, some aspect from the Civil War up through, up through uh, World War II. So uh, this is our Historical Research Center. Uh, this is the main viewing room. And uh, we've actually just uh, did some uh, remodeling in here as well over the summer. Um, and so this is a little bit different than this photo. Um, we're, we were currently closed uh, off to the public until the summer. And then we opened by appointment only. And now we're moving back to just everything online. And I'll walk through everybody on, the, on, on how, how to submit uh, your research requests. And we just do it all via either by mail or email for you right now. Um, it's only by really appointment if we, if, if we need to call you, if we have questions on your research request over the phone or over the email or under, under uh, you know, some, some circumstances we might bring you in if, if you absolutely have to look at primary sources or, or original uh, letters or records. Uh, we do have some historians right in the middle uh, working on their uh, finishing up their books or right in the middle working on their dissertation. Um, or we even have um, we've contracted uh, with some some um, movie companies that are working on, on things we have to provide as well. Um, but those will usually get appointments and everything else we've been able to handle over the uh, email or over the phone uh, to send, send out the research. And uh, we had always done that before COVID and we received research requests around the world. Um, we did a lot of research requests for uh, soldiers in Afghanistan working on genealogy, uh, soldiers in Iraq working on genealogy in their spare time, we would send, send them research requests anywhere from Australia to New Zealand to England to France. It's just, we never know what comes in, um, but uh, it's a constant um, revolving uh, request. And we usually say it takes about six weeks is what we publish out there. But uh, I will share that normally we have the research to you all within one to two weeks. Um, uh, the reason why we say six weeks is because the college does take breaks like a Christmas break and such where there might be a two or three week lag before we're able to come back to do the research. But 90% um, of all of the uh, research we do, um, you're able to obtain within a week or two. Um, so it's a, it's a uh, really fast turnover. Um, we'll get into the holding center in a little bit, but this is uh, just, a, just a quick slide view. We have over 15,000 books in our special collections. Um, dealing everything from Texas history all the way through US military history covering all wars. Um, but primarily Texas and primarily uh, Civil War would be the, the bulk of, of, of the collection. And um, I'll talk a little bit about what we have uh, available and then I'll go into great detail uh, on a couple of case studies. So of course, everybody's heard of Fold3 database. That's nothing new to, to you all. Um, uh, before Fold3, we had all the microfilm uh, that Fold3 now has digitized. And so we go right and use Fold3, but we still have the microfilm just in case uh, there's something that Fold3 missed um, being digitized, which does happen. We have caught that a few times, um, as well as there are a lot of like Texas State Troops and uh, other real obscure microfilm um, that Fold3 does not have on their database. Um, of course, and we have the 15,000 books. Our vertical files are over 100,000 documents. Um, for those who have come to the research center or are known us over the years, you probably worked with Peggy Fox, uh, who uh, was a wonderful 
wonderful uh, researcher and genealogist. And uh, she basically put our vertical files together over her 35 year career. And there's over 100,000 documents in those vertical files, which contain original Civil War letters, original photographs, biographies, oral histories, unit histories, um, magazine articles, dissertation, theses, you name it, it's, it's, it's there. And, um, and it's all arranged either by the unit of, of the uh, Confederacy or Union or by the battle, or by the different prisons, um, or, or the uh, different topics like, uh, you know, we've got a large file on Texas uh, drummer boys of the Civil War and stuff like that. So it's, it's, it's used uh, quite extensively. Um, we're going to talk, whoops, we talked about the microfilm. We've got a large cemetery records as well. We've published a couple books on uh, prominent um, generals, um, let's see, colonels, and then captains, lieutenants, all the way down to all the officers uh, in, in Texas that were in the Civil War. Um, but we've collected cemetery records over the last 40 years nationwide of any Civil War um, tombstone in any cemetery. Uh, we've added that to those records as well. And so um, they're, they're also used a lot. And then what we're really known for are our capsule unit histories. Uh, we're the only archive in the nation that has this. Uh, we had put it together with um, uh, one of our uh, volunteers out of New York, and um, he worked on this his entire life and compiled 32,000 documents. Uh, we just got them digitized, so I actually know <laughs> the actual amount. And we have a capsule unit history on every Confederate unit and every Union uh, military unit in the war, including the Confederate Navy and, and Union Navy as well. And I'll show you a couple of capsule histories here in a little bit and what, what, what those are and why they're so valuable uh, to you all um, doing research on any of your ancestors during the Civil War. Um, then we have a little bit on World War I. Um, we kind of get into the order of the battle of the uh, U.S. land forces in World War I. They're the official unit histories. Um, so, of course, if you have your ancestors' personal documents of their discharge papers, enlistment papers of World War I, then we can take those and we can cross-reference that with uh, this series and really get into great detail exactly where they were during the war or over in Europe, what battles they fought, and the whole bit. Um, as you know, uh, the, the most difficult thing about World War I, all the way up even into a little bit covering uh, Korea War and even to the Vietnam War is, of course, you all know that the National Archives building there was, uh, that held the personal records was uh, put on fire and by protesters in 1972. And a lot of those official records burnt of the enlistment papers. And it's, it's really uh, kind of a 50-50 chance when you send for them, you either get back, they were destroyed in the fire, or you actually get something back. Yeah, we did, they, they, they did not get destroyed in the fire. Luckily, I know some of those have been reconstructed through the different VA um, administration, hospitals and such. And so I know there's been an effort trying to, to put those back together the best they can, but unfortunately, uh, a vast majority of personal records were you know, permanently lost in that, that fire. And uh, uh, there were no other, other copies except the copies that uh, were given to the actual soldier uh, when they were discharged. Um, but if you have those, we can help um, look, uh, kind of guide you through, through World War I. Um, with those. And then kind of similar with World War II, um, we have the official U.S. Army histories and a lot of other books and some other capsule histories of other campaigns. Not as extensive, um, unfortunately, as the World War I. Um, I think in time, this will come um, where we'll be doing more research, trying to provide more on World War II uh, capsule histories uh, in the near future. Um, but that's something we need to, to strive for since we do have the Civil War done. World War One's pretty much covered uh, by that other series, but World War II, we, there's a lot of work that needs to be done there yet. 
And then, of course, just on Texas history, we have many county histories on Texas counties, uh, a lot of books, the Texas Republic and on the frontier. And, of course, uh, we have a lot on the punitive expedition of Texas going into Mexico in 1916 uh, after Pancha Villa prior uh, to World War I with uh, Blackjack Pershing. And uh, we have a large Medal of Honor uh, collection. Um, we have a, an extensive vertical file collection on Audie Murphy's life, um, being the most decorated soldier of, of, of World War II. Plus, you know, he had a vast Hollywood career and made over 40 movies in Hollywood and such. Um, but we also have many other vertical files on other Medal of Honor recipients. Um, when we built the Medal of Honor Memorial uh, and uh, really put this collection up front, um, we have been able to add a lot to it over the last uh, decade and a half. So, wrong way. Okay, so we're gonna kind of gonna get into the meat of the presentation today, which we're gonna look at if you, um, do write in, I usually say, come down to us and visit us. But if you do uh, fill out the forms, this is what we will do for you. And uh, if we don't get all the information, we'll usually have to talk to you and, and interview a little bit more and pull out some more details if we get stuck. But uh, we really try our best to do the best job we can for every single research request that comes into our research center on uh, Civil War veterans. Um, we do charge $30 for the research. However, if we don't find anything, we don't charge you. And if we feel that, well, you got a little, but not what we think that, you know, you should be charged. A lot of times we don't even charge you for it. Um, just because, you know, the only time we really charge the $30 is if we were able to really get you a full detailed uh, information on, on the veteran that you, you were seeking uh, information on. Um, so, Today, we're going to look at 2nd Lieutenant Andrew uh, Bertzel Briscoe. Uh, he was in the 8th Texas Cavalry, Texas Terry Rangers, Company K. And um, we'll look at what would happen if you come and, and, and ask uh, for us to research a, convet a Confederate veteran. And then I'll do the same thing again uh, on the Union side if you're going to uh, ask us to, to look anything up on a Union uh, veteran, because they are a little uh, different. Um, and what we can offer uh, the Confederate veterans versus the Union veterans. Um, so of course, most of you are probably familiar that with this. The first thing we do is go to Broadfoot in the roster of Confederate soldiers and trying to find uh, the name of, of your soldier. So right here we have Briscoe. Um, it uh, does not have his full name. Uh, Andrew Burtzel spelled out, he went by AB. Uh, again, it says Texas, a cavalry company K, and he was ended up being a second lieutenant. Um, now, most people, you know, you know, Briscoe is not a not a real real uh, famous name by any means, but you can still see there's probably looking at this probably close to sixty, maybe seventy Briscoes that fought in the Civil War. So we always try to ask what was the state they came from or uh, enlisted in, if anybody, uh, if the family knows any of that information. So sometimes we have to kind of dig a little bit and narrow it down because a lot of times people just have a last name and no first name. And if it's just the last name and no first name, we really can't help you. If you have a first name, that's better. Sometimes we have to go to the initials like we did here with AB. And it's even better if you know the state they came from. Um, we just try to keep narrowing it down to make sure we're researching the correct veteran. So the last thing we wanna do is research a veteran, obviously for your family or, or for someone else, and it's not the right veteran. Um, so we really try to narrow that down uh, in the very beginning when we uh, look at the research request. Um, so of course, you all been to Fold 3. If, if, if again, before this point, before Fold 3, we would just go to our microfilm and pull a lot of these up. And this is their uh, personal uh, military records. Um, the first card you usually get is the enlisted card uh, when they first enlisted into service in, in, in the Civil War. And you have A.B. Briscoe up here and he enlisted in Houston on September 7th, 1861. So just shy of what, 160 years ago, right? By just uh, three days. Um, 
And what's really rare after looking at, you know, tens of thousands of these cards throughout the years is uh, when someone lists and lists for the entire war. Um, very, very rare to see that. Um, most enlisted men would enlist for six months or nine months or a year, um, but very few ever joined for uh, the entire war. Um, uh, Hood's Douglas um, uh, Brigade out of, um, that was a battery, an artillery unit out of, out of Dallas in Tyler, Texas, uh, their whole unit signed up for the duration of the war. Um, and they're one of the very few units that actually did out of the entire Confederacy to, to sign up for the entire war. So uh, we've got we've got some interesting pride uh, in Texas where you would think you'd see that more in Virginia and some of these other states. But uh, um, we see a lot of it in Texas. They sign up for the duration of the war, which is really neat. The other card here just shows again that um, he uh, is in Company K and. Um, and in, in, in the 8th Cavalry. And um, basically these were roll calls for pay throughout different months of service. Um, if your soldier's a private, you might have one or two cards, uh, maybe three or four. Um, AB uh, here, uh, being a Lieutenant, he's gonna have more, uh, officers had more. Um, so I did not put all of those in this presentation, but just to kind of give you an idea, um, they basically say the same thing, but they tell the year and the date that, uh, basically when they were last paid, when roll call was, and if they were present, if they were absent, if they were hospitalized or any remarks would go down here. Um, and they kind of keep going on. There's a couple more, uh, kind of going through the war and, uh, for like this one says absent and he was missing. Um, a lot of times, especially with um, different cavalry units uh, of the Civil War, a lot of them had gone on, had other assignments, uh, other scouting assignments, this type of thing, where they just were absent. Um, but does not mean they were uh, AWOL or anything else like that. Sometimes it does, but a lot of times it does not. Um, they're just off on a different assignment. Um, and then of course you see the next card, he's, he's present again. And uh, this one's real interesting. Um, it uh, really shows the, um, basically when someone's promoted, especially from a private to a battlefield commission officer, he was uh, um, basically elected in uh, March, uh, January, March area of um, uh, this one actually says January 6, other documents say March, he was elected um, as a, a second lieutenant um, in his unit. Um, but um, so this is kind of rare. You don't see this a lot of times. You don't see battlefield commissions all the time, um, especially from a private in, right into an officer. You see this a lot if they're already an officer, they might be promoted from a lieutenant to a captain to a major and on up. Um, but that's what this record shows. And then again, you have the end of the war uh, where they were basically mustered out of service and basically put where their residence was um, at the beginning of war or where they're headed back to. And of course, he was born in Harris County, Texas, uh, actually just outside of Houston and Harrisburg, Texas. And um, so these are his personal records. So we, we look at those, you know, normally on full three, sometimes we have to, like I said, go to the microfilm and pull those. And then we go to our capsule unit histories. So again, this is what makes us uh, one of the, the best archives on Civil War history in the nation. And um, it's funny, I uh, took the, a group of Hill College students on a historical trip, um, about a 10 day trip of Civil War battlefields. And uh, we met with the historian at Gettysburg. And he says, you know, a lot of people come to Gettysburg and wanna do research on the Confederacy. And he says, all the park staff says, well, you have to go to Hillsborough, Texas to get it. And so uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's exciting to hear other, other uh, parks and other, other, re other you know, entities uh, recommending us uh, to send people for their research. 
So basically, uh, all of our capsule histories will talk about kind of how each unit was formed and then talk about all the different companies. So if there was a company all the way through L and then the nickname. So AB's company um, was also called uh, K Company, but also Tom Lubbock Guards. Um, and they were mainly recruited out of Harris and Montgomery counties, um, or also known as uh, Lubbock's Calvary. Um, so when we're doing research, it's interesting. Some people will refer the, to uh, 8th Texas Calvary. They'll refer it to the Texas Terry Rangers. They'll refer it to the Lubbock Guards. They'll refer it to the Lubbock Calvary. But you can see we probably have about, a, about 12 different Calvary names here. And we have different nicknames out throughout here too. So it can get very challenging at first trying to figure out what unit uh, your ancestor or the, or the soldier you are researching really truly is in from a historical uh, perspective, especially if all you knew was maybe the nickname um, of, of that unit. Well, then after that, we kind of go into uh, okay, the, the, the Eighth Cavalry was, was uh, created, but then how what it, was it attached to the bigger divisions and the bigger armies, you know, of like the Army of Mississippi, or we had, you know, here we have uh, the Second Division, the Army of East Tennessee. We show how they were attached all to the bigger, bigger divisions and brigades um, of the Confederacy as well. Then we go right into, uh, which is fantastic, is we list every battle, operations, skirmish that each unit was in and try to put the dates of those in chronological order. Now, the 8th Texas Cavalry, um, they were in over, my gosh, they were well over some historians say about 250, other historians say about maybe around 180 uh, skirmishes, engagements, and battles. We did them in our capsule history for this one, we did the major ones. But uh, this particular unit was in more battles and skirmishes um, and engagements than any other Confederate unit, unit in, in the entire war. So it's pages after pages talking about exactly where they were during the war and for how long and listing all the, the skirmishes and battles and operations. And uh, it's just a, a, a lot of battles. Most capsule unit histories might be one page, maybe two pages. This is um, almost six pages of battles um, and skirmishes they were in. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the Battle of uh, Bentonville in North Carolina. Um, here we have it as the, the, the 91st thing we have on our map. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about that. That's why that highlighted. Um, but when we, what we do then, it's number 91 was the Battle of Bentonville. But we also provide maps to show you uh, all the numbers of all the engagements they were in. So, of course, you start with number one, go to two to three, and you just basically follow the whole unit exactly where they were during the war uh, from, a, from a geography perspective. Um, so you can really kind of trace the footsteps of your ancestor um, across the states and across all the battles. And then we got uh, the Atlantic campaign, a little bit more zoomed in uh, with more numbers. Um, so that's our, our uh, capsule unit history. So we try to... Uh, provide the personal records, and then we provide the capsule unit history, and then we can dig deeper. Uh, so the next thing we do is we look in our uh, vertical files to see if there's anything on AB uh, Briscoe we have, and we have a mustard roll of Terry's Texas Rangers compiled by Jonathan uh, Claiborne at the uh, reunion in Galveston, Texas in 1882. So this is the uh, original um, Muster roll from 1882 from that reunion. And it lists um, uh, Briscoe here and that he was in Harris uh, County, Texas, and that he was elected uh, as a second lieutenant. And um, the interesting thing is with the Terry, Texas Rangers, there were 1,200 men who started. 
out uh, in the war, and only 240, about, well, about 250 um, lived through it, um, and actually uh, then started coming to the uh, the reunions. Um, so they lost um, they lost most almost 80 percent of their entire um, uh, unit during all those skirmishes and battles they fought in. And um, so then we can go to our um, other file here where we have um, photographs, a lot of photographs on, on, and we actually had a few on him. Uh, this is him uh, taken uh, in 1903, uh, you know, about uh, 40 some years after, well, just shy of 40 years after the war. And then, um, Here's a zoom up of him. I, I uh, blew up of him in a reunion picture in 1908 that was uh, uh, taken of him. And he's got his reunion ribbon on here at the Texas Terry Rangers uh, reunion. And uh, this is, um, so it's neat. So now, again, now we're able to show photographs of, of, of them. We, of course, we don't have photographs on 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 you know a lot but we do have quite quite a few on texans and especially if they were an officer uh in any texas unit we we, pro we might have a photograph of them and then hood's texas brigade we have one of the most extensive collections on hood's texas brigade so if there's anybody of your ancestors in that brigade uh we do have a lot of photographs of of the men who are privates uh in, in different companies as well uh, of that whole brigade. Um, so then we'll go, uh, after we exhaust our vertical files, you know, looking at letters, looking at photographs, looking at mustard rolls, oral histories, memoirs, this type of thing. Then we'll go to our books. And um, I just pulled up the Terry's Texas Ranger Trilogy um, by JKP um, Blackburn, which was a primary source. And um, basically I found here in the book where uh, Blackburn had a letter um, written from Lieutenant um, Briscoe talking about the very last battle, the very last Texas Terry Rangers gallantly charge towards the Union soldiers. And that happened at uh, Bentonville in North Carolina. And uh, this is actually uh, Briscoe's uh, own words talking about the battle and how they charged 500 yards on an open field and, and they just rode right into the Union forces line and they captured about 200 prisoners. And uh, he further goes on and talks about how uh, they, lost, they lost a lot of, you know, they did lose some men in that battle as well. And um, this was the last major major battle. Um, and then there was a few little skirmishes after this, and then the war ended. Um, so that's just a, another neat primary source right out of one of our books um, with an original letter uh, talking about his experiences, which is really neat. Um, and then, so that's basically what you'll get um, for a Confederate veteran, if you're lucky. And I'm going to say probably 80% of the time, we're, we do pretty well. We get people a lot of information. Uh, we find their, they, we find who they are. We find their personal records. We find the capsule history. We sometimes find some primary sources or a photo or uh, other information. You know, if they were captured, we'll provide information about the prisoner of, of war camp where they went to, or if they were killed in battle, we'll try to provide some information about that particular battle, uh, that type of thing. So if you're going to um, come and do any research on the Union side, uh, we have a lot less information on the Union side than we do on the Confederate side. Um, but we do have all the capsule unit histories on the Union side. So you do walk away with, with um, some information. Um, sometimes you get a lot, sometimes you don't. But, but the majority of the time you don't get as much as you would as uh, if you uh, submit uh, for a Confederate uh, veteran. So we're gonna look at uh, Private William uh, Newby. Um, he was with the 40th Illinois Infantry Company D. And um, interesting um, fella, um, 
both of these uh, case studies are, are my relatives, by the way, but um, uh, I like to talk about them. So that's why I put them in. Uh, but again, we went to, uh, we go back to Broadfoot here, uh, except now we go into the union uh, side of things. And the unions are um, records and Broadfoot are categorized by state, not by, not by the whole union, like the Confederacy. The Confederacy is all put in alphabetical order. Doesn't matter what state they're from. On the union side, that's not the case. You must know the state they're from. So right away, you have a little bit of a roadblock. Um, you, you really need to know what state they're from before we can go any further uh, researching the union better. So we went into Illinois and, um, oops, sorry. And here he is, a uh, new by William, 40th Infantry, Company D. And again, full three database uh, veterans file here. It's some um, records. Um, normally, you don't have a lot on full three if you've looked at any of the union files. It's basically just a card and basically says you have to go to the uh, National Archives to pull up the, the, their information. Um, and I do know looking um, pre COVID that, um, boy, did their prices go up. We were able to used to be able to obtain these records for around $25, $35 uh, pre-COVID, and then they shot it up to about $100 um, uh, to to retrieve those records. Uh, Again, of course, when they open back up, uh, they'll probably have the service again and the price might even go up again. But so I know it does get awfully expensive unless you go there in person, um, they really went up on their rates on, uh, which is, which is, I think is sad. Uh, they went up so high. Um, I was a little shocked when I started to research him, uh, Peggy Fox helped me. Uh, she was still working at the, uh, historical research center with me when I was hired. And we were both surprised, um, because, um, when we got to his pension file, um, Oh, and I should add, I should add this information, of course. You can now get a lot of uh, the Texas pension files um, from the Confederacy on Ancestry now. Um, and uh, for the Confederacy pension records, again, you have to know what state they applied for. Not what state they fought in, but when they left the war and they applied for the pension, you must know what state they applied in. And you have to go through the state archives to get the pension records. For the federal union pension records, it's all federalized. You have to go through the National Archives again. Well, the pension records for uh, William, uh, we were in shock. And of course, I did not put all that on here. It was over 700 pages, which is just blew our mind. It has got to be the record for the largest pension record ever. And so we're like, okay, what's going on? We're like, something happened, obviously, to have a pension record 700 pages. Um, so it's interesting. In his pension record, there were also photos, which is unheard of. You don't usually see photos in the pension file of, of the soldier as well. And uh, he basically joined out of Illinois, and they went down the river, and uh, ended up at the Pittsburgh Landing at the Battle of Shiloh in uh April of 1862, and the story should have ended there because he was killed in battle. That, that, that was his story. Very first battle ever he was in, um, he was shot in the head. Um, that was um, uh, witnessed by his captain, and uh, they just presumed he was dead, and that was it. Well, that really might not, I'll say might, might not have been the case. Um, because the other story goes by that, yes, he was shot in the head, but did not perish. He was actually uh, captured by the Confederates and taken to a prisoner of war camp down in Florida. However, when he was shot in the head, it gave him permanent, almost permanent amnesia, and he couldn't remember who he was. So after the war, he became a wanderer. And he just walked and he just walked and he went from state to state, just walking. And he ended up walking back into Illinois and he 
and started walking into White County, uh, where he is from, and he started recognizing things. He remembered the cemetery his father was buried in. So he went over the cemetery to look at the tombstone. Went into town. People recognized him. Oh my gosh, is that William? And everybody started recognizing him. And then his brother showed up. His wife um, never remarried. Now you have to remember, this is in the late 1880s, early 1890s when he returned. So 30 years later, he returns to their hometown. And everybody is just in shock. And his wife is in shock, never remarried. Uh, they had, uh, I believe, four children before the beginning of the war. And so he got reacquainted with his family and things were going well. When the family started thinking, well, you've never been discharged from the army. They owe you a lot of back pay. Well, they applied for all that and had to go through a federal court. And the federal courts did not like this at all. And it was kind of um, the judge and the jury was almost kind of set up for defeat for him. Um, uh, the more historical record you, you, you read about his trial and, and what happened. Um, and so, yeah, his pension record has all these depositions uh, testifying, yes, this is my brother. Uh, yes, this is my uh, uh, son. Or yes, this is my cousin. Uh, and so forth and so forth in that pension file. Well, guess what? They lose the, they lose the uh, court case. And so he, they don't get any back pay uh, from him being in the Civil War, uh, never discharged for 30 years. But the federal government says, well, we're going to take your pension away, too, from um, his wife. And his wife went and said, well, wait a minute, if, if you don't, because the federal government did not believe that was William. They thought this guy was an imposter. And that's how the, the federal government took their stand. He was an imposter. This really wasn't him. So anyway, they say no. They lose the case. They take her pension away. But she said, no, wait a minute. Why are you taking my pension away? If you think he's an imposter and my husband really died at Shiloh, then I should be able to keep my pension. And they said, no, we're taking that away. You don't get that anymore either. And then they sent him to prison for being an imposter. So then he served a few years in prison and uh, uh, got out and started being a wanderer again. And he's buried in an unmarked grave. Um, and so there can never be any DNA testing or anything really to prove if he was uh who he says he was. Um, I think the historical record shows that he probably most likely was just because he knew so many family facts uh, when his memory started coming back and uh, everybody recognized him. And uh, there was just too many, too many uh, similarities for him to really pull this off as an imposter. Um, so anyway, we'll go back, uh, just an interesting story about him, but we'll kind of go back into what the Union capsule unit histories look like. Um, so this is the, the 40th uh, Illinois Infantry. Um, and again, we, again, we talk about exactly how the, the unit came to be, who the nicknames of the 40th Infantry uh, were named, and then um, how it was attached uh, to the different districts and brigades and divisions throughout the war. And then we go into all the engagements. And again, I highlight the Battle of Shiloh, uh, Shiloh at Pittsburgh's Landing, where uh, William uh, uh, supposedly uh, was killed. And then um, it goes on, because of course, you know, even though William's story ended there at Shiloh, the 40th continues on fighting throughout the duration of the war. Um, and then right here is, of course, uh, Battle of Shiloh, number three, and uh, more maps. And then we go to the vertical files, at, you know, with, with the Battle of Shiloh. And, uh, of course, I went to the Shiloh battlefield and where it was able to work with us, you know, park historians to exactly, almost exactly where their unit was located and probably where he was shot uh, within, within a 10-yard radius, probably where he fell. Uh, during that battle and then either died there or was captured and then um, made his way back into 
into uh, Illinois there. Um, so that's basically what, what you'll get uh, with our uh, capsule unit histories. Um, so basically right now, um, our, our uh, museum for the galleries, if you wanna come and see everything from the Texas Revolutionary War up to the Vietnam War, we're open Monday through Thursday from eight to four and then Fridays from eight to 3.30. And then um, our uh, research centers by appointment only, but really that's by really by phone call right now. Um, and uh, unless you absolutely have to come in to look at primary sources, then we'll, we'll, we'll make those arrangements. But I do wanna show you how to um, go to our website and fill out the information it's all electronically sent. And so, oh, so I need to probably minimize this and go to the website if I can. So let me, um, but I will leave this up for a minute. Um, you can email me personally. It's uh, jverselewis um, at hillcollege.edu. That's my email. You can, anybody can email me personally anytime on any information and I can look it up for you um as well and i'll also show you where that request form is so let me escape here oh i'm gonna have to go back in our time so let me go yep. back in let me find it here and while you're looking for that i'm just going to launch a quick poll just asking people to if you'll indicate whether you're a dgs member or not so we can have an accurate record of who showed up Okay, we're seeing your desktop and not seeing your browser yet. Okay, come on browser. I've got it opened. All right, can everybody see the website? Nope. Not yet. Okay, so maybe go back into share. share. Well, we're, we're sharing your desktop. Do you have two screens, John? You know, I'm, I must. Let me. <laughs> <laughs> what are you, are you seeing this black? Box. Yeah, the we're seeing your, parents, your, it looks like. your lovely mom and dad. Oh, okay. Um, you should just be able to slide your browser over to that screen, that window. I should. Um, or stop sharing, and then when you go to share, just share the open the yeah, browser me, window first let me, and share that. Let me stop share. Well, I'm going to end the poll. Thank you all very much for that. Mm -hmm. And I know I have two. Uh, or John, so while he's getting set up, if you guys um, have thought of any questions, uh, we can ask him after he shows us. Okay, I stopped sharing. Are you still, are you seeing? You probably so still not, seeing no, so start your browser and then share again with us, please. Okay. Oh, shoot, I don't lost my. Okay, you should see it now. Yes. Perfect. Okay. So this is basically, uh, uh, the, you know, hillcollege.edu. Um, this is our main college website. And at the very top, you'll see a blue bar here. It says Texas Heritage Museum. Just go ahead and click on that. So, and this uh, is the museum. And then just scroll down to the second division, which is Historical Research Center, and hit Learn More. And then basically it's a, it's a $30 fee, but we do not charge you until we've done the research. How about that? Because again, we do not want to charge you all if we don't find anything, that's not fair. And you go here to Civil War Research Form, click on that. And then you just fill out all of your information, the name of the Civil War veteran, their dates, their date of birth, anywhere they lived during the war, maybe their wife's name, state, county, date of death, any specific information you're looking for and then hit submit. And then we'll follow up with either an email or a phone call. And like I said, normally we will have most of the research done and you'll have it within two weeks. Um, but we do allow six weeks just because of some of the breaks we take. And uh, uh, with COVID, you know, sometimes I've got uh, employees out and, and things too. So that could, that could, that could put a damper on getting some research out. But um, like I said, normally we have it out within two weeks. So I'll take any questions, I guess. So I'm going to stop sharing.
if I can. So I just uh, here. Well, let's see. There, great. Excellent. All right, Jan, uh, John. Thank you so much. Goodness gracious, that was a lot of great information. And um, Jim, do you want to? Are you seeing all these questions in the chat? Boy, we've got lots of questions and. Uh, yeah, I mean, if anybody has any questions, uh, we can ask them for you, but I'd encourage you to go ahead and unmute yourself and just ask John. That way you can make sure he has a good handle on what you need to know. Okay. All right, I'll start since nobody jumped in. <laughs> John, one of the questions that I have is my um, Civil War veteran was from Alabama but he uh, registered for the war in Tennessee. He did not come to Texas until he was in his um, 50s. So I don't know, and he was a union soldier as well. So I don't, does the collection only hold Texas soldiers or um, does it include others that uh, maybe have submitted things uh, to, the, to your collection? So the, the bulk of what we have is going to be on the Confederacy. It's going to be all okay. Confederacy, so all states. Oh, um, great. Out of that, out of that uh, Texas is obviously going to be our largest amount of all of, okay. of, the, of the Confederacy states. And then Union, you know, we have the Union capital histories, but then we also know the way to navigate through the National Archives when they reopen on how to request the pension files or their actual service files and such. Um, so, you know, even if you moved to Texas and, and, you know, he still would have had to fill out a pension federally. And so all of that would be at the national archives. Gotcha, um, gotcha. Oh, wait, you, 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 let me back up. No, but he was a Confederate, correct? No, he was union. Okay. Then, yeah, yeah. Then it would still be, no. still be at the national archives. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay, great. And my but, but we could supply the capsule unit histories and we would still... That would be really cool. I love that. Yeah, yeah. Capsule like, is amazing. Yeah, and we have some, you know, we have some extensive amount of information on some union states, but not all. But we okay. do on all the Confederate states. Mm -hmm. Okay, super. And then uh, my father was in Vietnam. And we have just recently discovered about 100 photographs that he took during um, his time in 1964, when he was in Vietnam, he's got pictures from the aircraft. He's got pictures of his aircraft. And there are also photographs of the first um, military procession of uh, the eight, first eight soldiers that um, died in battle. So um, anyway, is that something that your um, a collection might be interested in copies of these photos. Um, yeah, so a couple things there. So yes, we, we encourage, uh, we love to take digital photos um, um, or copies of, of, of photos of any text in any war. And okay. we can make a vertical file in their name and we could put any information in there. Of oh, the, that'd be the, cool. Of their copies of their service records or copies of their, uh, of their experience. And then in our Vietnam exhibit, if they are a Texan, we'll also put them on exhibit on our Texas wall of yes. Vietnam veterans yeah. as well. So they'll go on oh, exhibit be so cool. and then we'll have a, a, a vertical file. And, yeah, uh, like you know, if anybody ever wants yeah. to donate like a, a, a uniform or anything like this, you know, we first ask, you know, before you donate any originals, if that's what those are the wishes we want to make sure nobody in, in their family or your family wants it first. Cause if you actually donate an artifact or donate the original, then it, it, it does become the property of, of the college and the, and the museum. And, um, but what we ask is we really don't want a uniform. We want a uniform with pictures and their story, because mm -hmm. again, if it goes on exhibit, we we're, you know, we can show the uniform, but we want to tell mm -hmm. what they did and what they experienced mm -hmm. and, and really honor them. So uh, anything that we get, we try to really get the story and really get a photo of that individual who used that object or, or had, to, had that artifact. Oh, that would be so cool. He's, he's got some great stories. And, um, and so I'll get with you later about that. Sure. Sounds great. All right. 
We had a, a question from Kathleen Williams. Kathleen, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Yeah, I'm curious um, about the, the books that No College Press published. I looked on the website and maybe I'm just missing it, but it wasn't obvious. Um, Correct. Yeah, we, our, our website is very limited, unfortunately, and the college is looking at trying to put a new format where we could do a lot more. If you'll email me your address, I will send you, we have, we published a, uh, almost a pamphlet on every book that we've published. And I'll just, I'll oh, send you great. Uh, so just send me your address. Uh, okay. if, uh, again, that, uh, you could either go to the Hill College website and, 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 uh, Click the general email or, or, or my email, again, is jverselewis uh, at hillcollege.edu. Okay. And I also uh, just wanted to say for anybody who's out there looking, so it was it was 21 years ago, but um, my husband's ancestors fought in Hood's Texas Brigade. And I've gotten a whole one of, the, one of the Hood's Texas Brigade books, and there was a picture of him in there. And I had called the, the uh, research center and uh, and asked, I was like, oh, yeah, we have that picture. We can send it to you. I was like... Are you serious? Wow. And uh, anyway, y'all sent it to me. I made a copy of it. Um, it was really neat because his grandfather passed away later that year, but he had never known his grandfather who had fought in the Civil War and he'd never seen a picture. Wow. And so I was able to give my husband a picture of his great great grandfather, and his grandfather got to see a picture of his grandfather. It was super cool. That is super. Uh, and that was, it was, that was awesome. It's not something typical, I'm sure, but it was still awesome. That's fantastic. Thanks for letting let me know that. Yeah, we really, really try to make sure everybody has access to all the photos. And, you know, if it's for a personal family usage, this and that, we give them to you all. Um, if, if somebody's publishing a book, we first just got to make sure we have the copyright course. If it's back, if it's an actual civil war, you know, the copyrights for uh, photos, the copyrights run out, we, we can do that. But um, um, so sometimes it's challenging when when certain authors want to publish because we might not have the rights to that photo or that photo, uh, another archive that we know might actually have the rights to it. Um, but if you're not publishing a book for profit, uh, we will provide you a, uh, an image. Yeah, no problem. That's cool. That is great. Okay, thank you, John. Um, Kathleen Murray had a question. Kathleen, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Sure. So simple. Uh, do you have any Spanish American war records? You know, we, we, we don't. But again, um, I have helped a couple hundred researchers fill out the paperwork uh, to send off for those. Um, they are uh, a lot cheaper to obtain than, than the Civil War. And the turnaround before COVID was just almost about a month. They were real quick. Uh, they're at some smaller, archi uh, some smaller archives in the National Archives system. And Normally, you get back quite a bit of information on each, each soldier. So we've had really good success. Um, so again, if you want to email me, I will um, scan in that form and highlight exactly which archive you send that off to. And hopefully when you know COVID ends and they're accepting applications, you can send that sucker in and hopefully get back some good information. Mm, okay. Excellent. And I did put your email address into the chat John for uh, the Thank you. email, John. And uh, I know when John and I were talking and discussing this program, talked about possibly a an April field trip for uh, coming down in, and uh, visiting your collection. And uh, so that's definitely in my thoughts. I would love to come down to, uh, to visit and have a tour and do some research. Yeah, that'd be great. And, uh, uh, you know, by the spring, we, you know, we were going to be open yes. for tours like everybody else was, right? And now we just mm -hmm. got to shut big tours down again. So, but I'm sure by spring, we'll be back, you know, fully operational with tours and the research center won't have all these restrictions and all that as well. Cool. That would be great. Susan Rainwater, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Okay, well, I'll ask Susan's question for her. She wants to know, she has, says she has someone listed in the 1850 census in a ranging company, which she thinks is the start of the Texas Rangers. Do you have records for any of these companies? 
So we don't because that is more um, so that there's the Texas Terry Rangers who were a military unit. And then you've got the Texas Rangers, which were more of a, a posse, more of a, a you know commission under the governor of the state of Texas. But all of those records uh, in great detail are at the Texas Ranger Museum in Waco, Texas. And they also have an extensive archive. So if you just go to the Texas Ranger Museum website, mm -hmm. click on the archives division and contact them, they would have that information. Great, thank you very much. Does anybody else have any questions? It's been a great presentation, John. I, for one, am guilty of not knowing that the Hill or uh, the Texas Heritage M Museum was even there. Um, so I'm going to make sure next time I'm down that direction, I'm going to stop by and visit. Or when, absolutely. I, when I can, absolutely. No, I can't do sure, it right now, sure. but when I can, yes, I'll stop by and visit. Definitely. So. And right now, again, if you're just traveling down I-35 and you want to stop, you can. You can still see all the galleries. Uh, just got the just the research center uh, closed right now to okay. the public, but you could sure see the galleries and, uh, uh, you know, and if you guys were from this program, let me know, uh, shoot me an email ahead because I'll try to give you a personal tour. Oh, that would be That'd awesome. That'd be great. John, I have put the um, museum's um, link into our chat, but I'm on it right now. Would you walk me through? I'm on the Texas Heritage Museum. I'm scrolling down. Yeah, so you go to the Historical Research Center, and there should be a red yes. button. Click that. Okay. And then once that's clicked, Historical scroll research. down. Research, okay. Yep. And then learn more. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, yep. great. And then you click that, and then you'll And then I the, see the Civil War the research uh -huh. form. Now, um, let me see if um, I can put that into our chat. And, or do we just fill it out online? You just fill it out online. Uh huh. Okay, gotcha. Then, yep. Okay. Um, when, when Peggy was there, she asked for people to send her information on where their ancestors were buried. Uh, now, mine was a private, but I, and I, he had a, a relative that was, I don't know, I think made it up to corporal, but I sent those to her. So, do you still have those? We do. We still have the cemetery records and we, we're still adding to them. Um, okay. Yes. Any more questions for John? I have one question. Okay, go ahead. Um, do you have anything about the um, Mexican War, the war with Mexico, 1846 to 1848? We have very little. Um, again, we would send you to the National Archives on that as well. Um, however, we do have a, a large, a rather large exhibit in, in, uh, in, uh, about it. In, in, uh, but as far as research records, no. We would, again, I, if you want to email me, I could uh, uh, fill, fill out, highlight the forms of where you need to send off for those records as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I'm seeing, uh, thank you for the wealth of information, excellent presentation. Uh, so a lot of good comments in our chat, John. Thank you so much for being with us. Great, thank you all. Have a great afternoon. Oh, we okay. a Labor Day weekend. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, me too, I too, John, I wanna thank you very much for being here. And it was a very, very informative presentation. Mm -hmm. I had no idea you had all that. So that's it's definitely amazing. a resource I'm gonna be taking advantage of. Mm -hmm. And with that, we're gonna go ahead and end our meeting for this afternoon. And um, just as a reminder, next month will be a librarian from the Library of Congress. So don't wanna miss, oh, yeah. miss that. And also check out our um, website for all the events that are coming up between now and then, because there's a, a bunch of stuff happening with the, the new year starting back up. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, everybody. And I hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Mm -hmm. Bye. This has been a production of the Dallas Genealogical Society. If you're already a member, thank you. Your fees have been supporting these and other society activities. If you're not yet a member, please consider joining now. Go to dallasgenealogy.org and click on the membership tab.